I've obviously thought about like you have those moments like if I knew what I knew now what I what would I do I, yeah I, th th this is a brain blast I have all the time it's like if I knew what I knew now I feel like I could Artiaga drives one to center Miller hustling over diving catch by Ian Miller a great catch three two one Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Nine Hope Podcast. This is your host, Ian Miller, and today I am joined by Cubs starting left-handed pitcher, Justin Steele. Steele, what's going on, brother? How you doing? I'm doing good, Ian. Thanks for having me, brother. It's always good to talk to you and uh, love this podcast. Let's do it a handful of episodes now. Thanks for having me. Love it, dude. I've, man, the, the pleasure's all mine. The honor's all mine, dude. Thank you for your time. So we've had dudes on here, um, you know, some legends on here, right? So we've had lefties like Jamie Moyer, uh, Randy Johnson on here. We we kind of talked a little bit about the pitching side of things. Obviously, I was an outfielder, right? So I don't necessarily know the ins and outs of everything when it comes to pitching, especially lefties. Legally, since I was a left-handed hitter, I wasn't allowed to face left-handed pitchers. So I don't <laughs> even know, you know, how to crack the code on the, on the professional baseball side of things with the left-handed pitchers, man. But I kind of just wanted to ask you some stuff about your story, your journey, um, and the success that you've had uh, over your parts of three seasons, man, but especially like last year, dude. Um, mm -hmm. Right. So, a 28 year old left handed starter coming off a career year um, as the Cubs ace, dude. So, 2023, you fucking made the all star team, which is unbelievable, dude. Uh, fifth place in NIL or NIL, excuse me, NL Cy Young. Uh, voting, which is huge, dude. So 30 starts in 2023, 16 and five with a 3.06 ERA, which is an absolute banger. Uh, set 176 Ks and 36 walks in just over 103, 173, excuse me, innings pitched, man. That's, that's incredible. Dude, what was the secret to that 2023 success before we kind of like jump into your journey, you know, to the show, like this past year, man, what was the secret sauce there that was different than any other year? Um, th thank you. That was a great question. Uh, thanks for, you know, reading off the stats stuff. Made, made me feel good about myself ah, there man. for a minute. Love that. But, uh, but, uh, I, I would say that the secret is just knowing yourself, knowing what makes you good. Um, I kind of started doing that in, 2020 when we were together and um, I started kind of figuring out who I was I added the slider the slider kind of helped me you know put away at bats get into it bats and you know I just started figuring out my forcing the way it cuts in on righties I started really honing it in and um, yeah I was just riding my strengths I mean I threw them two pitches probably 97 percent of the time and then I sprinkle in my curveball change up and two seam as needed you know to them guys that are you know, making adjustments on them two pitches or whatever the case may be. But, um, yeah, man, it's just so important to know yourself, know who you are as a pitcher, what makes you good. Like, you know, for instance, like you're you're really fast. Like you wasn't up there trying to hit the ball out of the park every time. You know, you're one of them guys get on base, steal a bag, steal a bag, scoring position. So uh, it's all about, you know, just knowing who you are as a player, what makes you good what makes you the best you can be to help the team. And um, I feel like me and Tommy Hadovy, the pitching coach, and, you know, everybody else involved, we just did a really good job of that. I love it, man. So just touching on what you just said, right, knowing yourself, knowing your strengths, knowing your weaknesses, and, and being able to maximize that, in, in, a, in a sense, I was a speed guy, right? So something that I struggled with was honestly putting my pride aside – uh, when I got to the big leagues, I was fortunate enough, right, to get a cup of coffee with, you know, the Twins and the Cubs, man. That's, you know, being with the Cubs is where we cross paths. Mm -hmm. And it was tough to me really to buy in, right? So as you said, man, I was, I used my legs, I used the defense, man. But of course, I wanted to get up there and bang. I wanted to prove to everybody mm -hmm. that like I could hit the ball out of the ballpark or get the ball in the gap. And obviously, like, that's not indicative of my tools and the type of player I was. So it did more harm than good, right? You touched on your success with, the fastball slider, the, you know, those dominating pitches and being able to, you know, mix in that, that curveball, man, and, and kind of just really buying into who you are, man, as a starting pitcher, um, with all those tools in your tool belt, man, is it tough going up against lefties and righties, man? I, I know like out of the pen, dude, left on left is damn near impossible. What's it like being a starting pitcher and having to go through the order maybe two or three times on a, on a great night? Like, dude, what is that like? 
Yeah. So, I mean, just something I started to notice as I got into the big leagues and started facing more and more lineups is they would start stacking the lineups with right-handed hitters, you know, just naturally facing a, a left-handed pitcher. And I used to hit as well. So I, I understand like the lefty lefty, like how hard it is. So I kind of always have that in the back of my mind is like, I, I know how that left-handed hitter feels in the box with me on the mound. Like there's just kind of like a mental thing there too. So I have confidence with that. But teams just started stacking lineups with right-handed hitters, and I kind of just got really used to it and really good at, you know, making my four cut in on their hands below the bat, below the bat, trying to get it above the bat, backdooring it, and then throwing, you know, the slider off of it, doing whatever I need to do with it. So it was kind of just like a uh, trial and error thing, especially in 2020 at the uh, the COVID site where, you know, stats weren't really being recorded, but, you know, we're getting real at-bats in there, live ABs every day. And, you know, I was really able to hone in my craft during that time and not really worry about the results. That's big time, man. Not, not worrying about the results is huge. Not getting lost in the noise, man. I wanted to ask you, I'm reading an article on MLB.com that talked about, you know, your preparation going into this offseason after coming off I'm going to say it, a career year, that year that you just had was unbelievable, man. So I'm reading about your routine and your preparation. Um, so you spent you spent the, the year out in Arizona again working out at the Cubs facility, man. Was was that routine and preparation pretty much the same the year before in, in hopes of being able to pull off another career year this year? Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, if, it, if it's kind of what the, uh, the saying, if it's not broke, don't fix it. So me and Keegan Knoll, the strength coach, we kind of – attacked the off season from a strength and conditioning perspective pretty similarly um as far as getting better because you don't want to just get complacent at where you're at um if you ever i'm sure you've heard this if you ever feel like you've got something figured out in this game that's that's a scary place to be right. um so so uh yeah so to, to get better is for me, I want to throw, you know, beyond 173 innings. I want to get up over 180 and stuff. So I was making sure I was getting my treadmill work in, doing the proper things in the weight room to get my body in the right position. And, um, you know, obviously just, you know, honing in them other pitches. Um, obviously, I'm really confident with my four seam and my slider. But just making sure, you know, I continue to work on the curveball, the change up, the two seam to have those pitches. If I can get those pitches to a confidence level as my four seam and slider, and then, you know, you have a complete bag and you're able to do whatever you want in any given situation. Dude, I love it. That makes a ton of sense. Obviously, I'm not playing anymore, so I'm able to kind of see from a fan's perspective, right? Or, you know, uh, sports media type per perspective. I absolutely love it. It makes a ton of sense. How important is it being a starting pitcher to have a routine? So with with the the, the players and the coaches that kind of follow along with the podcast, man, it ranges from, you know, little league to the big leagues, man. Um, mm -hmm. The younger players that I talk to and that I surround myself with and I work with out here, they don't necessarily know about a routine yet. They haven't had the failure or, you know, the consistent success that helps them kind of put together a routine, man. Being a starting pitcher, being one of the best in the world, regardless of if you want to admit that or not, right? How important is the routine on your side of things? Yeah, routines are very important. And um, so like, for me, the, my week is a five day week, because it's just some, it's a five man rotation, usually. So having your day to day routines, kind of what we're talking about set already and know what you want to do. It's very important. It gives you a foundation to build off of. But it's also very important that you don't make your routine religious, as I would like to say, because you don't want to be um, to where you kind of lean on it like a crutch almost like you don't like it because things don't work out perfectly all the time. You don't want to be, you know, in St. Louis, it's a hot summer day and may maybe something was forgot in Chicago and like the specific whatever is not there for you. Like you don't want to be able to use that as a crutch. So like my um, routine, like the days I pitch, like I'm very simple. I don't really listen to music. I like to interact with my team, talk to everybody, treat it like a normal day. Um, obviously do the things to get my body ready, foam roll, lacrosse ball, um, just all the normal stuff you would do before getting ready for a start. But I, I keep it very simple the days I pitch. And then obviously the day after you pitch, you want to be in the training room, the weight room, doing the proper recovery stuff. For me, I do soft tissue work. I do a lot of shoulder work. I try to 
really take care of my legs and my hamstrings because it's such a long season. Um, but routine is very important, but it's also very important that it doesn't become religious to where you like feel like you have to do things that for in order for you to perform. For sure. Yeah. If, you, if you're stuck in a way, right, cemented in a way, it almost becomes that crutch. You're handcuffed, right? Yeah. You have to do it. Yeah. If I don't get my yeah. fucking foam roll in or the lacrosse ball in, I might not pitch well tonight, right? You don't want that. Yeah. Yeah, you don't. Yeah. It's, and I feel like a lot of people has probably been there before. And it's not, it's not a fun place to be. So it's very, it's very good for you and just kind of freeing to be like, if I don't do this, I'm still going to be okay. I've done it before already. Like, you know what I mean? hundred percent. So it's, you are not set in a routine. You have a foundation of a routine, but you are not um, superstitious, right? You don't have to yeah. do everything exactly incrementally the way it was done last week in order to pull off another, you know, quality start, right? That's awesome, man. I absolutely love that. Um, exactly. Regardless of the start, regardless of the outing, how do you, how do you break down and gauge that? So like, man, I'm sure let's say you go seven strong at Wrigley against the White Sox, you shut them down. Uh, you pitch seven innings, a, a one-run baseball, man. How do you go back and break that start down? Is that maybe the next day? Is that that night? Are you looking at video? Are you looking at data? Like, what do you do with that in anticipation of building up for next week? So I'm not a big video guy. I look at video when I need to. So, like, I don't watch every start, whether it's good or bad. Um, if there's something I am working on specifically – say I'm tinkering with my slider and my breaking balls and uh, there's some pitches from an outing that I remember throwing and I like remember the feel. I really liked how it looked out of my hand. So I'll watch that video kind of a lot. Like I'll watch it a ton so I can like see it, feel it, watch myself do it. So that kind of gets like ingrained into my brain a little bit. Um, I don't, I really don't watch like bad outings because I don't want that to like linger but like if there's something that I'm doing wrong, me and Tommy will like identify. He does a really good job of watching my film and identifying if something's wrong mechanically and stuff. So he'll come to me and we'll watch it and then go through a bullpen to make adjustments. Um, but something we are going to do this year um, is the day after outings, whether it was good or bad, there's going to be one sequence and one at bat that Tommy and I go over. That's something we're going to implement into this season. So I'm excited to do that. Ooh. That's that's big time. So you're you're consistently uh, improvising, adapting, and overcoming, man. I wanted to touch on a little bit, um, you know, with with Tommy, right? Kind of that relationship there, how you guys work, um, man. The success you've had, right? Over 349 MLB innings, you're averaging over a strikeout per inning. Um, 361 Ks versus 113 walks. That's absolutely absurd, man. How do you consistently miss bats? Uh, especially, right, going up against those righties. I know you talked about, man, you wanted to get, you know, maybe the the fastball under the hands. You're working on the two seam. You're working on the curveball. I had uh, Corey Muscar on here, who is the pitching coach for the number one team in the country in college baseball, Wake Forest. He talked about he wants dudes that are unconventional. And, and what that means is, like, I think the average fastball in the SEC, right, the SEC reigns supreme, is like 93, 94 miles an hour, which is fucking, that's top notch, dude. A 94 is no like walk in the park. Yeah, dude, it's elite. But he's looking for dudes that can maybe throw like that, but can mess with either the arm angle or can implement a cutter or can kind of mess with the hitter's timing, maybe mess around with where you're at on the rubber, right? So when, when you talk about your relationship with Tommy, man, how does that kind of factor into the success you've had? Um, I just read something online, man, where he talked about, man, you kind of get on the side of the fastball which kind of enhances that cutter movement. Is that something that you are implementing on purpose or is that something that kind of Tommy's been able to unlock in these bullpen sessions and, and, you know, the video sessions? Yeah. So really good question. Getting on the side of the ball is something I've always done. It's just um, my, uh, I would guess you, I guess so the correct way to say it is my wrist is always kind of supinated when I'm throwing. So there's the guys who pronate. Those guys usually have like good sinkers, good change ups. Guys who are really good supination is really good uh, cutter, sliders, breaking balls, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And guys that are really good at all of them are your Greg Maddox and your Max Scherzer's guys <laughs> who pitch for 15, 20 years. That's right. Um, but yeah, so he was able to identify. I, I kind of knew I cut the ball a lot, 
but he was kind of able to identify why and what made it cut. And just over trial and error through bullpen sessions with him, we were just able to really hone it in and get it really consistent to the point where I'm able to, you know, for a righty, I can go down and into the righty and try and get it below his barrel. And if he does hit it, it's, you know, good chance it's going to be a ground ball to the left side. Or if I want to, you know, O2 count, get it above his barrel, I'll get it cutting up and in on his hands, riding on his hands to the skinny part of the bat to where it's missing his bat. And then you just start working on things to where, like, you do that enough, you open it up, and now you're back doing it low and away, and it looks like it's 20 feet away. So it's just just working with him, you're able – one, he makes all my pitches better and consistent and to the point where I'm able to play with him. And then once you start implementing that, that's, like, when it's really fun because, like, it takes a while to get to that point, especially through a long season. But, like, I would say, like, usually – almost halfway to the halfway point is when you just kind of get in a groove and you're able to start manipulating your pitches how you want and stuff. And he's just really helpful for me in that sense because he just gets me there and locks me in. If something's go, not going the right way, he identifies it, gives me a good key, like, you know, stay back or whatever the word he uses to uh, relay the message to me. He's always just really good at that stuff. I love it, man. So over the course of – you know, your journey to Major League Baseball, man, what would you say has been the biggest challenge or, you know, biggest maybe obstacle that you've had to overcome um, kind of getting to where you're at right now? Yeah, I would say the, there was the injury in 2017. I had Tommy John surgery. Um, that was 2018 was also the year that the Cubs were going to be uh, making a decision on me whether or not they wanted to add me to the 40 man. So I remember in 2017 going into that 2018 offseason, I tore it in the end of the season in August. So I pretty much like worked really hard, had a really good season, blew out, and then I uh, had to go to Arizona, get the surgery, and pretty much start over again. But uh, I remember in that process, because like, you know, Tommy John surgery, you kind of have to look at the big picture at that point, the light at the end of the tunnel, it seems like it's so far away. I just remember I just had to really learn how to take things day to day, like, you know, wake up. What do I need to do today in order to get better, get towards my end goal? And um, in that process, in that rehab process, I just really found out who I was, you know, not just as a physical baseball player, but mentally as a person and all that stuff. And it just kind of really helped me, not just in baseball, but life, just, you know, being able to take things day for day, take things for what they are, be where your feet are. And yeah, I ended up just flying through that process. I, I was back in games at like eight or nine months. I tackled Whoa. the rehab process. Yeah, I was I was back really fast. And um, I was facing hitters 10 months. And I, I came back towards the end of that 2018 season. I was in games. I want to say I pitched like a month and a half. So I, I blew out August 17th, I believe of 2017 and I was I finished the season in double a of 2018 and then uh because I remember like it was my 40 man year like they had to make a decision on me so I like kind of needed to make a point and like give them a reason why yeah. to put me on the 40 man so I came back super fast they gave me a chance to pitch in the fall league that year I was throwing hard you know uh showing what I could do and stuff and they ended up you know adding me to the 40 man and stuff and um, following that year, I remember going to double A. I was excited. You know, I achieved a goal, got on the 40 man and everything in a great position. And um, the double A year didn't, you know, I was struggling at the beginning of the year, trying to figure some things out. And then I ended up tearing my oblique on my right side. So I, I say tear. It was like a pretty severe grade two. But um, I remember that was like just kind of sucked because I was like getting to the point where I was like a you know, knocking on the door. If they need help, I'm there. I'm on the 40 man already and stuff. But I remember when I did my oblique, it was kind of like a reset again. You know, you just went through the TJ process, worked your tail off, but um, got double A, that happened. And then COVID happened once I started rehabbing from that. I got that back to 100%. And that's when we met at the uh, COVID site. You know, we get, became good friends and everything. But yeah, I mean, in any process, you know, climb through the minor leagues, whatever you want to call it. There's going to be trial and error, there, trial and error. There's going to be good days, bad days. And uh, you just got to make sure you're, you are where your feet are. You're always learning, always adapting. And um, I mean, yeah, 
I, if there was another struggle, I'd say I struggled a little bit in low A. That was the first time as a professional athlete and as a baseball player, I kind of had to face adversity. I was kind of getting to a point in competition where I needed to make adjustments and stuff. So that was also a learning curve for me too at uh, 20, 21 years old. Yeah, dude. It's what I've seen, what I've, what I've felt, what I've experienced and, and what I've heard from, you know, other athletes, other players, other baseball players. It's like, man, whenever that adversity kind of hits somebody in the face, punches them in the gut, whatever it is, man, it's like, you got two options, dude. It's either you can fucking go right through it or you can shy away and turn around, right? And just, you know, rid yourself of the problem. Dude, it's it's awesome to hear, um, you know, what you're saying, right? You just being able to get through the adversity, grind through it, be where your feet are. That's absolutely incredible, man. Um, being where your feet are, right? So right now you are in spring training, right? I think I believe today was the first day of spring training. You're getting after it. Man, what is like your downtime like? How are you able to decompress? How are you able maybe mentally to like get away from the game? What do you do in your off in your off time, man? And and how do you be where your feet are at? Yeah, so I'm actually really good at detaching from the field, you know, decompressing and stuff. I have a great foundation at home. My wife, my kid, they do a great job of taking my mind off of things, playing with my son Bo is always, you know great joy after the day he doesn't care if i pitch good pitch bad he's always gonna enjoy seeing me um my wife does a great job of uh you know she she understands the baseball life if, I, if things don't go well you know she's more supportive things go well she's your know, number one fan and everything so it's i say that to say it's very important to have a good foundation at home you know you want to be surrounded by people you love people that really care about you um that's a that's an important part because it makes it makes decompressing coming home a lot easier. Um, for me, I do a great job of that because I play a lot of video games. Um, I come home and that's kind of like me unplugging from the real world, all of my, everything that goes on. I can just like hop into a game, play with my good friends. You know, me and you play call of duty from time to time. I'm playing with my boys back home and stuff. It's just that for me, that's kind of my way to detach and, you know, obviously have your hobbies. Like I, I collect sports cards. That's something I like to do. Just having your hobbies, stuff you like to do outside of the field is very important. And uh, I, I'm very good at it. <laughs> I love it, dude. No, that's fantastic, yeah. man. So I, somebody reached out to me today um, on the nine hole um, mm -hmm. Instagram and man, they were, they had no idea that you were going to be on tonight. They just so happened to be a left-handed pitcher. Right. So he's a 6'3, 225 pound left handed pitcher in college. Um, and man, he he's like upper 80s, low 90s. Right. Can't seem to get past 91 miles an hour. His words, I don't throw hard enough to get Major League Baseball scout looks. Right. I can't get past 91 miles an hour. This is a fucking big dude. Right. That is a left handed pitcher and can throw 90 miles an hour. Right. It's pretty solid, dude. Um, do you have any tips or any type of ideas that you can maybe pass along to like the next generation of dudes that want to be literally just like you want to be able to achieve and do great things like yourself, like in the game of baseball, man, what can you maybe, you know, bless them with? Yeah. Um, when I, in my career, when I've been, you know, striving and wanting to throw harder, I, I threw harder probably right after my Tommy John surgery. And I was just, you know, in the weight room all the time getting as strong as I possibly can, as flexible as as I possibly can. I think flexibility is a huge thing. Um, but I remember I just did a ton of shoulder work, you know, not only like, you know, you have your, everybody has a shoulder routine, you know, 90, 90, this way, that way, do a ton of stuff to strengthen the muscles around your shoulder, even your forearm, just everything that goes with, you know, making your arm move faster and be stronger. Another thing is just being athletic. You don't want to be a robot trying to throw 90 miles an hour. It's good to be athletic, loose, and whippy when you're trying to create that much momentum. So for me, like, I, I just remember after the TJ, I was, you know, obviously want to see if I'm healthy. So I'm, you know, firing bullets trying to, you know, test this thing out. I just remember uh, every time I would play catch, I was throwing hard. You know, you're not going to get to throwing hard by just, you know, playing normal catch. Like, you need to throw hard on the regular basis, get your arm accustomed to it. So, I just remember I would get to 90 feet and I would just start letting it rip on a line, back it up, let it rip on a line, 
you know, get your uh, and kind of goes with the athletic part, like get your feet moving, get, you know, try different things. Try like opening up your hip more. Try to be more aggressive with your hips. Then try to be more aggressive with your torque of your abs and everything. So just different things to uh, kind of make your body move better and faster and more athletically. Man, that is beautiful right there. I love that. I'm, I'm, he's probably watching right now. I'm going to pass it to him regardless, man. It's going to be fantastic. So, man, you were, you were I committed. That I hope that helped. Dude, what? Of course that helps, man. That's fantastic, man. So you were committed um, to go to Southern Miss, right? Um, out of high school, man. You got drafted fifth round, um, made it to the big leagues. Obviously, huge success there. Dude, you've, you've been around. You've been around some of the best baseball players in the world. You've grinded. You've come up right through the minor league ranks with those guys. I was fortunate enough to get to the big leagues. I was not fortunate or good enough, I'll say it, to stay there. Dude, in your opinion, like in your experience, what you've seen, um, you know, what what you felt like, what are the difference between, what is, I should say, what is the difference between the dudes that get there and the dudes that stay there? Is that a talent thing? Is that maybe like a work ethic thing? Is that just like, it does some luck play into it? Like, what what is that? I'll, uh, it's a really good question. Um, and I think a lot of people ask, and there's a lot of people in the position. I remember being in that position of trying to figure that out and, um, you know, observe different things as to like why this, this guy or that guy or what makes it work, what makes it don't work. I think the difference is, is what the, the, the main thing is everyone's good. Everyone in AAA, everyone in the big leagues, Everyone has talent at the, you know, out the wazoo. Everyone's talented. Everyone's talented enough to play in the big leagues. I think the most important thing is knowing why you're in that position and what makes you good enough to be in that position. Kind of like what I was speaking on earlier about knowing your strengths and stuff and really honing that in and writing, writing what got you there and then being able to implement other things and adapt. I think that's kind of what separates um, you know, what you was asking the guys that stay and the guys who can't is being able to do adapt, being able to change on the fly, being able to do different things and be in different situations and still be comfortable being, being comfortable, being uncomfortable as, uh, as the saying is or whatever. But, um, it's, it's a really, that's a really tough question to answer because there, there are guys who are just talented enough, no matter what, to stay in the big leagues and, the guys who have that talent, but they're also able to make adjustments mid game, dude. Those are your, you know, Paul Goldschmidt. Those are your guys, you know, that stick around forever and bop no matter where they're at and just yeah. they just rake. You know what I'm saying? So you just gotta be able to identify what those kind of players are, why they're staying, why they're not, and just knowing who the person is, especially. And uh, yeah, I would just say knowing yourself. I love it, dude. I love it. So, yeah. man, in 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 these three seasons that you've had with the Cubs, man, you've obviously you've put up really, really, really good numbers. You've been consistent there. In your travels, man, all across the country, all around the world, playing baseball, dude. Where is the best spot to visit? Right, aside from Wrigley, like, dude, Wrigley's the best spot in the world to play baseball. I can say that I did it, right? Where, in your opinion, is the best spot to visit, be on the road, whether it's the city or whether it's the field, like wh whatever vibe, man, what's what's your favorite spot? Yeah, so uh, if we're on the road, best road spot for me is Miami. And it's strictly because they put us in a nice resort hotel on the beach. And I'm a oh. sucker for I'm, – I'm a sucker for a beach vacation. It's like every time <laughs> we get – Every time we go there, it's like you're just taking a little vacation in the middle of the season. And it's right. like so refreshing, especially if you have a day off, just be able to like lay by the beach and just kind of like we were saying, like detach. It's yeah. like you're getting a little detachment in the middle of the season. And like even when we're playing there, like, you know, you lay on the beach in the morning, have your cup of coffee, and then you hop on the bus and go to the field. You're just feeling good. Like, yeah. you're, you're like, man, like I'm having a good day already. It's uh, I really like going to Miami. It's uh, uh by far one of the like my favorite hotels to go to and so but I mean we stay in so many cool spots like when we come out here to Arizona and play the Diamondbacks we're staying at the Phoenician with the golf course and just the nice pool and like everybody's hanging out and stuff there's I mean it's it's great I love it that's so hot 
So are you able to like, let's say you're pitching, let's say you're pitching today um, and you're in Miami. Would you be able to be outside on the beach before you get to the field? Or are you the type of dude, this is how I would look at it. I'd be like, man, I can't be out in the sun. So I'm gonna get fucking tired before I get to the field. Like, is that something that might, you know, impact you? No, uh, if it's, if it's to a point where I would be thinking about it, that probably means it would be too hot. Um, gotcha. but I wouldn't, I don't think, I don't think I would think about it too much. Cause I want to say I pitched in Miami one of the times we were there and I remember like Libby and Bo were with me and they were out by the pool and I was down before the uh, night game started and stuff like playing with them by the pool, laying in the shade and stuff, not doing anything too crazy, but if it's to a point where I'm not thinking about it, I don't think it's going to impact me really. But if it's, like I said, if I am thinking about it, then it is probably something I wouldn't do. That makes a ton of sense, dude. So, man, obviously throughout your career, throughout, you know, your climb, right from Little League to the big leagues, man, you've had to, you've had to just dominate. You've had to kind of stand out. You've had to separate from the pack, dude. Um, if you had to do it all over again, right? So I touched on, I alluded to, you know, who my audience is, man. It's 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 younger guys, it's dudes that want to get to the league. Man, if you had to do it all over again, be a left-handed pitcher, right? Let's say, you know, you made it to Southern Miss, or let's say you were back in high school again, tr- you know, trying to be a top five round pick again. It's like, dude, how? what would you do? So how would you pitch lefties and why? How would you pitch righties and why? I don't want to say like in the show, dude, how do you attack righties? How do you attack lefties? Like that's, we, I don't think we need to go there, but like, if you had to do it all over again, what would your game plan be at the high school or collegiate level, knowing what you know now, how to get, how to get hitters out? Like, how would you attack that? Um, that's a really good question. I've never really thought about that. Um, I've obviously thought about like you have those moments like if I knew what I knew now what I what would I do I, yeah I, th- th- this is a brain blast I have all the time It's like if I knew what I knew now I feel like I could hit could have hit a lot better in high school <laughs> and, like, that, that's how I look at things I, like I love hitting I believe and it. stuff I love hitting and stuff so I'm like man if, if I knew what I knew now like I, I would have been a lot better hitter in high school um, but as far as pitching goes. Kind of, uh, I've already touched on it, but it's like just knowing yourself, knowing why you're good, what what makes you tick. If I could go back, I would not necessarily worry about throwing as hard all the time. I'd really worry about like what makes them swing and miss, what makes me good, what gets the ground balls. When I do get hit, why am I getting hit? Is it because it's over the middle of the plate? All right, let's make sure I get that pitch to the inside part of the plate. Make sure it's above the barrel, below the barrel, those kinds of things. Paying attention to swings. At, uh, at that age is really important just because like if you don't have the velocity just to overpower people it's really important to just miss the bat um what do you so, mean pay attention to swings like if, if 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 a player might not even like have that unlocked yet like pay attention okay, to swings like if he's ass out flailing at it unless you're a guy who throws the pitch and you're not looking at like what's going on in front of you like if you're able to throw your pitch and like see the swing, say you throw your fastball, you're not necessarily like tr- trying to see see what his swing is like. You're trying to see what his swing is on your on your pitch. So say you throw a four seam low and in, he swings over it. So you know with his swing, he's going over that inside pitch for me, especially if it's cutting. Now I know I can play with that low and in part of the plate. I can throw sliders off of that, something that starts there slides off of it you can go above the barrel and then you have guys who are get they can get to that low and end pitch and then you're like all right you got to be able to recognize that say he you know smoked it foul but it was a barrel and then you're like you need to make that mental note he can get to that pitch now find somewhere else to work kind of deal Ooh, dude that's fantastic that that blows my mind i'm actually like sweating right now thinking about it like i can't even just reading swings and stuff, man, that is like baseball so hard. That is insane. That's a different level of like focus, tenacity. I love it, dude. Uh, two more, two more questions I got for you, man. Again, extremely appreciative of your time. Actually, this is a perfect time to give a shout out to the sponsor of today's stream. Just remembered the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, LLS, and the Cleveland Student Visionaries of the Year. Um, man, so they are right now amidst uh in the middle of the seven week challenge to raise funds for the fight against blood cancer they're doing a great thing 
uh, man, st these these student athletes, these leaders, man, are, are are you know raising money for a great cause, man. The fight against blood cancer. Check them out. Uh, link will be in the description. Obviously, the do the donate link will be in the banner. Check it out, man. Uh, very appreciative. Thank you uh, again for you know sponsoring the stream. Check them out, man. Great stuff. Two more questions for you, Steel. Uh, man, big time right here. So your call up. Everybody talks about their call up, man. Every some people have had great call up stories. Mine, oh, the sun's starting to go down. Thank the Lord, dude. So now I can move <laughs> over here a little bit. So my call up story, dude. I I came up with the Mariners, got drafted, didn't do so great in the minor leagues, didn't warrant a call up, but I got traded, right? So I went over to the Twins, got traded. I was there for a month, and I got called up by the AAA coach who I just knew for a month. So it was very fucking transactional, like shake my hand, good luck, you know, no hugging anything. Dude, it, it was still amazing, right? Still amazing, but it yeah. wasn't like they won't make a movie out of it, dude. Did you have a different experience? Was your call-up story like awesome? You'll you'll remember it forever, or was it kind of just like, eh? I'll, uh, so I'll definitely remember it forever. It's something I won't forget and stuff. Um, so in 2020, when we were together, I got called up for like 10 days and I didn't pitch. So like I was, I got like 10 days of service in 2020, um, was in the bullpen if, you know, quote unquote, shit hit the fan. Yeah, but it yeah, just yeah, never, yeah. it just, it just never did. The 10 days I was there were always close ball games. They're not going to let somebody debut in that situation, that type of deal. And I ended up not even debuting in that year. So it was kind of like, I remember that off season. I was like, Am I a big leaguer? Like, <laughs> so, uh, but I wasn't, I remember I didn't stress about it too much. I was like, well, the, the opportunity presented itself. I, I felt like I was ready. It'll happen again. I didn't really worry about that too much. 2021 comes around and uh, I do end up getting called up early on in that season. It was still from the, an alternate site type deal. Um, it was in Milwaukee. There were no fans still, so or there wasn't much fans. Um, but I remember too, right the dome. Yeah, yeah, indoors. I remember we were in South Bend. They were playing in Milwaukee. I had to be there that day for the game that night. Um, BJ, BJ, who is the best in the business, he's the travel That's secretary it. with the Chicago Cubs, the absolute best, unrivaled, unquestioned. Everybody knows it. Um, BJ texts me, calls me. He's getting me on the phone. He gets a sprinter van to the hotel, picking me up, driving me straight to the ballpark. Um, it was a rush. It was like my, you know, my my family and friends weren't even able to get there, so it was like a whirlwind type deal. Uh, the people, but they were able to get there in the next day, so it was no big deal. But um, yeah, I remember warming up in the bullpen um, of that. You know, obviously the anxiety. You're waiting on the phone to ring in the bullpen, so the phone rings and it like scares you. You like jump up. You're like, you're like, is it me? You're like worried to death. Um, but, going. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. You get the call and then I'm just warming up in the bullpen and I'm just, the adrenaline's through the roof. I'm just firing bullets. I'm like, all right, let's just make sure this stuff is going to be over the plate. Cause like, I know I got my juices flowing, like the stuff's going to be moving. I just need to make sure this is over the plate. So I kind of just went into the game with that mindset, just go out there and throw your best shit over the plate. Um, and it worked out. Uh, I got somebody out. I got a strikeout. I don't re really remember who I faced. Um, I was kind of like not worried about it. I was like just throwing my best shit. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was a good experience. It was a good day. Um, something I'll never forget. Oh, dude, that's fantastic. So uh, basically what you're saying is you got called up one year, but you didn't make the debut until the next year. It's crazy, but it all worked out, dude. So yeah. you, you obviously played through that, man. A couple of years under your belt this past year, you made your first all-star team, right? So what was that experience like? And man, like, how can you kind of put that into words to the next generation? Like, what was that like, man? It was, it was awesome. The all-star weekend, all-star game is extremely busy. You're, you know, constantly um, being pulled in different directions as far really? as media go. Yeah, you got to do, go do media. They're having you in different um, spots. You got to do the walk on the uh, red carpet, pink carpet, whatever. I, I, I saw exactly. pictures. I saw your pictures. From yeah, 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 yeah. Incredible. 
Um, so yeah, I had some family and friends there and stuff. Like I say, I say they keep you busy just cause like, I, I wish I would have been able to spend a little bit more time with family and friends, but all the events and all the stuff they have going on, it's a lot of fun. Um, everybody was still able to have like a really good time, but, um, yeah, it's just really cool. I just found myself because it was so busy, just trying to take like mental photos of everything. Um, the red carpet with my family and friends was really cool. Um, obviously pitching in the game was really special and by far the most special thing was it was mine and my son's birthday it was his first birthday we're both 7 11 born on 7 11 that was the day of the all-star game so that by far is what the coolest part of it was so that is wild man it's like the stars yeah. align and get goosebumps yeah oh getting goosebumps uh last question i got for you still dude i am ridiculous ridiculously appreciative of your time man thank you for being here so this is the nine hole podcast right where i speak to the next generation of nine hole hitters like myself right i got to the big leagues in the nine hole did everything from the nine hole dude when you think about a nine hole hitter right so you're you're motoring through an order and you get to the nine hole hitter man what what do you think about when you're facing a nine hole hitter like what kind of qualities and characteristics kind of pop up in your mind when you face a fucking baller nine hole hitter this is a great question and this is th there is an, a specific answer um a not a good nine hole hitter for me as a pitcher is someone you don't want to face you know he's going to bridge the gap somehow from the back of the end of the lineup to the front end again he's almost another lead off um he's not he's not going to give in to the bat you're not just going to throw three pitches and be done you're going to foul pitches off you're going to work the count it's usually someone who can run a little bit, so you can't walk him. You don't want to give up a double right off the bat. That's a good nine-hole hitter, someone who's versatile. They know who they are. They, they're they going to work the count. They're not just going to give the pitcher a free at bat, not a free out. Preferably somebody that could also swing with some power, someone that you're going to kind of have to, like, in the back of your mind, you know, like, I can't just serve a cookie up and, like, expect this guy to roll over. Like, this guy can, you know – do some damage someone i think like it comes to my mind is the atlanta braves lineup and how their lineup from top to bottom this past year like it seemed like everybody had 20 bombs at least at least 20. um so like that that was i remember that was a uh that, that was one of the lineups it was like man like, this entire lineup can go yard off of you so you got to be locked in the entire time but uh yeah i would say it's just someone that's going to work the count someone that's you know no free a abs at all that's my non hitter I love that, dude. That fires me up. That might be that might be probably the best answer that we've had here uh, on the Nine Hole Podcast. I love it, man. Steele, thank you for your time, dude. I thank you for letting me run you through the gauntlet of questions. Uh, <laughs> no, thanks, man. Of dude, of course, man. Thank you for being here. Thank you for blessing us with you know your journey and and just a whole bunch of ideas and knowledge, uh, kind of what got you to where you're at, dude. So that is everybody. Thank you for tuning in. This is. MLB All-Star, starting left-handed pitcher for the Chicago Cubs, Justin Steele. Justin, brother, thank you so much for your time, dude. Looking forward to the continued success and just hoping and praying for another big-time year for you this year, man. Thank you for being here, dude. Thank you, brother. Thanks for having me. Always love talking to you, man. Uh, best of luck, everything this year, brother. And uh, anytime you want to have me again, just uh, text me or call me, and let's play some Call of Duty soon. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. We'll see you here again next time. Take care, guys. Take it. Take it easy. Yes, sir. Thank you, Justin.